Hey there, everybody. This is going to be our first episode of the series of Unconventional Wisdom. Uh, we're going to talk about playing in 3-bet bots. Now, as you are probably all pretty aware, 3-betting is becoming more and more common, and it even happens as low as the smaller stakes games, which used to be much more passive. Um, as a result, it would really behoove you to learn as much as you can about how to play in these pots, what to expect from your opponents when they're 3-betting, and how you can really maximize your, you know, both making them fold when you have the worst hand and maximizing your value when you have the best hand. So we're going to go over a lot more um, unusual situations you can encounter and ways you can play a little more creatively and really own some people. Okay, this, our first hand, is going to demonstrate a few things about what happens when you are the aggressor. Um, what we're going to do here, we're going to 3-bet King-Jack in position. Um, we're facing a, you know, a raise from a, probably a, a standard 1-2 player, and he's got a wide opening range here, as most players do. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to 3-bet in position with King-Jack suited. Um, I like to do that because, we, first of all, we take the initiative, which is an important thing to have when you have a hand like this. Most of the time we're going to miss the flop. And if we miss the flop and he still has the initiative, he's mostly going to bet and we're going to have to give up, or we're going to have to make a play at something. But if we take the initiative, first of all, because he's out of position, many times he's going to give up on the pot right away. But if he does call, he's almost always going to check it to us, um, and we've got total control of the hand. Um, now... Most of the time, his range here for making a call out of position is going to be hands like, you know, pretty decent pairs. Um, so some players will call with smaller pairs, although that is usually a pretty bad idea. But for the most part, it's going to be pocket pairs, maybe some, some good aces, stuff like that. Um, but in general, a lot of times, we because we have the initiative, we're going to be able to take it away from him, uh, regardless of the flop. Um... In this case, it's an ace-high flop, which is pretty good for us. Uh, unless he has an ace, there's very little chance that he can continue on this board. Um, on the other hand, we don't stand to get too much action if we have an ace ourselves, so many thinking players are going to check behind this flop when they have an ace, ace-king or ace-queen. Um, try and get themselves a little more action on later streets. The board's pretty dry, so we're not concerned about him having a drawing hand and sucking out on us or anything like that. So the main reason we're going to check behind here with an ace is to get ourselves more action. Um, now to take that one step further, if we think that this opponent is aware of that, then we don't sacrifice too much in fold equity by checking behind the flop, and we gain more information about his hand. If he does, in fact, have an ace, then he's probably going to bet into us on the turn, and we can just fold and be happy about it. Uh, unless, we, of course, pick up a flush draw or something. Um, but if he doesn't have an ace, he's probably going to check it back again, and we can take it down with a bet. Um, so we sacrifice a little bit of fold equity by checking behind the flop, but if we can assume that he's thinking about the hand on a similar level than we are, then we can retain most of that fold equity and represent the ace almost as well as we could have. So we're going to check behind. Uh, turns the queen, gives us a gut shot, um, which doesn't really help all that much. But, you know, unless he has pocket queens, we still are, uh, you know, have the, you know, the initiative. He checks it to us, so we know he doesn't have an ace, probably. And we can take it down with the bet. Now, if we take it back one step here, you'll note that my bet size uh, is 32 into 51. Um, that's going to be smaller than most of the bets I would make in a, in a post-flop pot. But because I have it's a re-raised pot, people are going to play a little more straightforwardly generally, and a smaller bet is going to work just as well. So 
In re-raised pots, you usually don't have to bet quite as much. But, of course, you can vary those bet sizes one way or another. Um, and, okay. Now, this is actually going to be one of the only hands we have where we were the three better. Um, you'll find that they are much, pretty easy to play generally. You don't, you have to, you know, if you don't have anything, you usually bet and they'll usually fold. Um, you don't have to bet that much, of course, just three, three fifths of the pot or thereabouts. Um, make sure that, you know, you put them on a range and if you think that their range doesn't like to flop as much, you should be more likely to bet. But that's all pretty standard stuff. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that bet sizing also is should be balanced between your whole range, whether your bluffs and your value bets. Um, when you're in a re-raised pot, the pot's already pretty big when you get to the flop, and as a result, your value bets don't have to be quite as big to get all the money in if that's what you want to do. So that's why a good, you know, modestly sized bet is usually the best bet in a re-raised pot. Um, we're going to talk a whole lot more about hands where you are not the re-raiser. Um, hands where you call to re-raise and are looking to play back at the raiser or you know either bluff or try and maximize the value when you when you do have a hand. So we're going to look at a whole lot of those right now. Now when I said that was the only hand we would show where we were the three better, um, I wasn't being entirely honest. We do have some hands where um, we can go beyond three betting and use our opponents uh, over aggression against them. Um, this is a move that you may be familiar with from uh, the past. However, it's uh, it's occasionally useful. Um, it should be used sparingly, of course, because it is an expensive move and it is you know high variance as a result. Um, but if you're pretty confident in your reads and your image is clean, you can definitely pull this one off now and again. And the hand you choose to do it with doesn't really matter all that much, so long as you know in advance whether you're going to fold or call uh, a shove. So what we have here to look at is um, a fairly loose, aggressive button opener. Um, I don't have his exact stats on here, but as I recall, he was um, you know, raising a fair amount. Um, and the small blind here is also three betting a fair amount. Um, so this is sort of a situation where neither of them can really has a particularly strong range, despite the fact that they've already raised and re-raised. Um, as a result, we can show a ton of strength by putting in a four bet. Um, and again, it does not have to even be all that big. Um, compared to what's already in there. It's it's I mean hardly more than a min raise. But just the simple strength of the move itself is more than enough to make them fold any kind of a, a hand that isn't, you know, very strong. Um in this uh this situation we do it with pocket threes. Uh so if we get shoved on by either player, uh it's pretty easy for us to fold, even given the you know the pretty good price we're getting because so much of their shoving range is going to be completely crushing us. Um, in this case, of course, they both fold and we take down the pot. So, uh, use every now and then for betting, uh, even cold for betting, as a, you know, an alternative to just folding when there's a three better in front. So, you can use other players over aggression against them.